Okay, welcome to Can of Conversation number 258. On the last one, I spent the time talking about how the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost teaches us the things of God, the Holy Spirit's operation. And so this time I thought I'd talk about sort of an extension of that, talking about what the devil does in contrast with what God does through the Holy Ghost. As we talked about last time, the way God does through the Holy Ghost is that when you are saved, God makes your spirit alive in Christ. And then uh, God teaches you the things of God through, the, through you reading and believing God's Word. The Holy Ghost teaches you the things of God. And then uh, you are strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, Ephesians 3.16. And then you then use the mind of Christ to make the decisions on what you're going to do in your daily life. So the way God operates is through the Spirit. His, God is a Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So the way you worship Him or ascribe worth to God is you take your alive spirit learns from the Holy Spirit the things of God as you read His Word. There's a whole new definition to the word worship because most people, they'll read John 4, 24 and they'll say, you must worship Him in spirit and in truth, and then they'll go and sing some songs, and then they'll feel God. They'll feel His presence. But what they're doing there is they're not worshiping in Him in spirit and in truth. First off, the songs they sing probably contain false doctrine. A lot of the worship songs do. So they're not worshiping Him in truth, and they're not worshiping Him in spirit, because worshiping Him in spirit isn't about your feelings. It's about, it's about the communication with God, the Spirit, and that's where people get, get confused because of what Satan has done, and we'll talk about that a little later. But recognize that when you worship God in spirit, it's your spirit learning from the Holy Spirit the things of God as you read His Word. So the way you worship, worship is ascribing worth. So the way you ascribe worth to God or worship God is by reading and believing His Word. For example, if I wrote a book about accounting, since I'm an accountant, well, you wouldn't be ascribing worth to me if you just said, oh, I feel I feel good about Eric. Oh, he's, you know, I have a good feeling when I think about him and all he's done for me and all that. That's just feelings. That's all that is. Well, did you read my book? Well, no, I didn't read your book. Uh, did, did you learn anything from what I said? No, I didn't learn anything from what you said, but boy, I sure do feel good about all that you've done for me. I mean, that's what people do with God. But if you want to ascribe worth to me, you read my book and you learn from what it says. So that's ascribing worth. It says, here's the effort that Eric put forth to make this book, and I am showing that there is worth, or he is worthy of taking time and learning from him by reading his book. And that's what true worship is with God, not reading Eric's book. <laughs> but uh, ascribing worth to what God has done for you. It's not just, oh, I feel so good about God. I feel his presence here. Oh, God is so wonderful. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit here. That's not ascribing worth to God. Ascribing worth to God is, God has done so much for me, I want to know Him. Paul says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. You read the Bible. You believe what it says. You get the sound doctrine found therein. You ascribe worth or you worship God by reading and believing His book. And then God works through you. The Holy Ghost teaches you the things of God. And the reason God works by that, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is that God works on the principle of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 11:6 6 says. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The reason God is, uh, and the whole 
the whole difference between how Satan works and God works can be summed up in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. A God is a spirit. He operates in the spirit realm. You can't see him with your physical eyes. He is operating in a different realm than what you are in. What was what is so wonderful, what Jesus Christ's death on the cross atones for your sin. And you get to go to heaven as a result. People usually just stop right there. Christians stop right there. I'm a sinner. I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sins. I have the gift of eternal life. And that's good if you make it that far, because not many people even make it that far. But if you make it that far, you need to keep going. <laughs> God didn't just send his son to die on a cross so that he could, so that you could have eternal life. Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The abundant life is Christ living in you. God had Jesus Christ die on a cross. The primary reason he did that is so that he could dwell in you. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, but you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Basically what it's saying is that it's just like this car here. I bought this car with a price. And my goal was to indwell the car to get to where I needed to go. Well, God is a spirit. God says he wants to have a body to operate in. And so he made man to do that. That's why he gave man dominion of the earth. God is the possessor of heaven and earth, and yet he gives dominion of both to the man, Christ Jesus. Because God indwells Christ Jesus, and we are in Christ, therefore he indwells us. And so God's goal is really just to take his spirit and to operate in our bodies in Christ so that glory comes to God and also he magnifies man. Glory comes to man for allowing God to do that. That's the ultimate goal of Jesus Christ dying on a cross. And so the way God operates with you is he, walk, he wants you to walk by faith and not by sight. He indwells you and he wants the, the truths of the spiritual realm to operate. In Romans 8, 2 it says that God has freed us from the law of sin and death. And we should now be operating by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The way God operates is in that spirit realm because that lasts forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's why Jesus was willing to go to the cross. And no man yet ever hated his own flesh, Ephesians 5, 29 tells us. But yet, Jesus Christ willingly gave up his own flesh, recognizing that that's not the end all. Recognizing, as it says in Matthew 10, fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell fire. So don't fear the people of this world who can take your life, because they can only destroy the body. Once the body is destroyed, you're gonna get a glorified body, your soul lives forever, and you're gonna be in the presence of God forever for all eternity if you believe the gospel. That's what you should go after, fear God, not man. God wants you to walk by faith. That's why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We do not, God wants you to operate in the spirit realm because that's what's real, that's what will last forever, but you can't see it. So God wants you to walk by faith and not by sight. And so the way God works when he gives you the Holy Spirit and he teaches you the things of God through the Holy Spirit, he is teaching you truths that are applicable to that spirit realm. And he is operating in that spirit realm through you. That's why you present your body as a living sacrifice. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Our warfare 
Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds. We are operating through Christ in the spirit realm. And so God wants to fill you with truths of that spirit realm, which is only found in the Bible, so that He can work through you in that spirit realm and rule and reign over the forces of evil. And so God operates, we walk by faith and not by sight. God wants to uh, you operate by faith. So I talked about last time how atheists will say that um, we're not being rational, we're not being logical, and they operate by science and what's real. The difference between an atheist and a Bible believer, we're both rational, logical people. But the difference is an atheist is rational and logical based upon sight, based upon the material world. A Bible believer is rational and logical based upon faith, the spirit realm. So I rationally conclude, logically conclude that I am a sinner. I rationally and logically conclude that Christ died for my sins and that death is the fully satisfying sacrifice to pay for my sins. And I logically and rationally conclude that I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sins and then Christ lives in me. Those are all rational, logical statements. But they are only rational and logical in the spirit realm. In the material realm, they're complete, utter rubbish. Why would you trust in someone who died? Because death is the worst thing that can happen in this material realm. When you walk by sight and someone is dead and you see that, there's no life in them. That's why people want to live forever. That's why they go to the medical profession and try to lengthen their life. They want to live forever in this, these mortal fleshes because they walk by sight and not by faith. But when you come to an atheist, what they do is they attack churchianity because they assume that I believe in churchianity. So what churchianity does though, they don't walk by faith in God. They're not rational and logical in the faith realm. And they're not rational and logical in the material realm. They are superstitious and religious about the spirit realm. So they honor the things of God but it's all myths, it's all fairy tales. It's, well, I invite Jesus into my heart. Well, it's, uh, God, uh, Christ died for me, the least I can do is live for him. It's, um, I listen for the voice of God, the still small voice of God. It's, I invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come in and fill me. It's, uh, I speak in tongues. It's, I move in the Spirit. It's, I feel God's presence. It's, I feel good about myself when I sing these worship songs. Uh, it's all about feelings, and which is good in the material realm that you want to feel good, but approaching the spiritual by in a materialistic point of view as they do, all about how I feel. My grandmother read the Bible a lot of times, but she always say when she was confronted with the truth that she didn't believe, it was all about, uh, well, you know, I can't, I can't tell you, you know, I can't go against that, but I know that I know that what I believe is true. Well, it's because of experiences. It's because of feelings that she had. And that is religion. That's superstition. So the atheist is very logical. He comes against churchianity and has conclusions. And now, the atheist is very logical in this material realm, but he's very illogical in the spirit realm. But people who are religious or superstitious are very, uh, are illogical in the spirit realm. And so then they confront, the atheist confronts them with logical material facts, confronting the superstition of the spiritual, and the spiritual is put down. But if you confront them with the, with the rational, logical facts of the spirit realm that you learn through the Holy Spirit, walking by faith and not by sight, <clears throat> then they have no argument against you. Now, they'll have a logical argument on the material side. We have an argument, a lot of Bible believers have a logical argument on the spiritual side, and the two sides just can't meet. Uh, both of them are correct, uh, but they can't, atheists can't understand the Bible believer viewpoint, but they can't refute it either. 
So, um, so what Satan does, because Romans 1 says that we know there's a God, he's worthy of worship, we know his eternal power and Godhead, then what Satan does is he operates by sight and not by faith. And so he gets people who are unbelievers to operate like atheists do, rational, logical, scientific approach in the material realm, but not in the spiritual realm. So he fools them. And then he gets the so-called spiritual people, because remember, your spirit is dead before you're saved. So what he does is he gets you, he gets churchianity to approach the spirit realm from a religious, superstitious point of view. To try to walk by sight and not by faith in the religious, spiritual realm. That's why people go to church. A lot of them do it to look good to others or to feel good about themselves or to lose that guilty feeling. That's why people take communion at the, uh, you know, for Catholics. They take that or they confess their sins to a priest. It's so that they feel good even though they are a sinner. It's all about appearances. You know, I can pray and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sins, and right away, all my sins, past, present, and future, are covered. It's the fully satisfying sacrifice. But it pleases the flesh a lot more if I go to a priest in a church and confess my sins to him. But that's walking by sight and not by faith. And that's transferred over to the Baptist church as well, all churches. You go to the church, you become a member, you do what they say to do, whatever it is, and now you have the evidence, the proof, the sight of, of the material realm that you are right with God. But remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I don't need the evidence of confessing to a priest or going to a church or taking communion or giving tithes or becoming a church leader. I've got faith as the evidence in the spirit realm. And that's the only evidence that's going to be admissible, uh, admissible, admiss admitted <laughs> in God's court when he judges me to be uh, by sins paid for by the blood of Christ. Is the evidence of faith, the faith of Christ given to me when I believe the gospel. But because Satan, being the god of this world and the prince of the power of the air, he tries to fake the things of God, but he does it walking by sight and not by faith. The first appearance you have of Satan in the Bible in Genesis 3. Yea, hath God said, right there he's creating doubt in what God has said. And then, the way he gets Eve to sin, it says, when she saw that the tree was good for fruit, that it was pleasant to the eyes, it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband, uh, her husband, and he did eat as well. All that's walking by sight. God says, don't eat of the tree. And if I believe God, then I walk by faith and I don't eat of the tree. So what Satan does is he gets her to look at the tree and see, oh, it looks good for food. Oh, it's pleasant to the eyes. Oh, I should desire that tree. It's all, it's forsaken the realm of faith and it's going by sight. And so that's why you see things like when people say, talk about the Holy Spirit, walking being by the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. The Pentecostals say, well, that's speaking in tongues. That's moving in the Holy Ghost. The Baptists say that's... Uh, feeling good about yourself, feeling the presence of God. It's about a, uh, a burning in the bosom of the still small voice that's leading and guiding me in the paths of righteousness. And I've prayed and I've got confirmation and I sought the guidepost of life and I've looked at circumstances. All of that stuff they say is being led by the Spirit. I've got a book, Led by the Holy Spirit, out there talking about a pastor who did that very thing who made a huge decision leaving a church going to a a job uh, working at a, a religious organization as a president of a religious organization uh, because it was all circumstances it's that 
the board said that they thought God was leading him in that direction. It was that someone said that um, he quoted a former president and he used that former president's quote. Uh, he used some obscure passage in the book of Psalms out of context. All of that is not taking faith in God's word, it's walking by sight. And that's why you have so many feelings and emotions in churchianity. Remember what we said last time, James 3.15. The wisdom of this earth is devilish, it's sensual, it's upon your senses. People consider a good church service when they feel the presence of God or the Pentecostals speaking in tongues or they feel it's a good church service because, oh, the Lord really spoke to me in that message. Well, what specifically did he say? They probably can't tell you that. Oh, well, I just had a piece about what the pastor was saying. You get nonsense like that. What it is, it's just walking by feelings, emotions. That's sensual. And it's not, it's just like what Satan did to Eve. She saw the tree was good for food and she ate of it. Doesn't matter that God said don't eat of it. She walked by sight. And that's what churchianity is doing. It's, oh, it's a good service because I spoke in tongues or I shook in the Holy Ghost or I felt a peace about what the pastor was saying or I just felt confirmation in my soul that what I was thinking was true. And I just felt good about the presence of God during the worship songs. Uh, it was just such a good, peaceful feeling. And I just felt so wonderful in God's presence. All that stuff is walking by sight and not by faith. God says in his word, you are alive in Christ. He says you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. I don't feel like that because I'm in my vile flesh. I'm always warring against my flesh. A flesh flesh is against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. If I go by my feelings, I'm defeated. But because I believe God in His Word, I say, yeah, I feel like I'm really struggling here with my flesh and sin. But God says that I am dead to sin and alive unto Christ. Therefore, I'm going to believe that. And I'm going to read God's Word. And I'm going to allow Christ to live in me in spite of my feelings that the next half-naked woman that goes by me, ooh, I want to look, you know, or the next temptation to scam out there to uh, make a get-rich-quick scheme, ooh, I want to partake in that, or, you know, whatever it is. It's very easy for me to get sidetracked with my flesh, and if I go by my feelings, that's what I'm going to do. But if I walk by faith, I say, I'm dead to sin and alive unto Christ. I don't feel like that because of my vile flesh. But you know what? I'm trusting in God and I'm not believing my feelings. And so that's the main contrast. So when you see things like, well, you know, the, the things that are happening in churches and if it's all, if it's not taking the Bible as their final authority and they're just trusting in uh, their feelings and it's all based upon, yeah, I feel, I mean, even the pastors who supposedly exegete the passage and and say well the Greek word is this and the and the modern translation says this and the commentators say this they're going by their feelings on that the objective rule is the King James translators looked at it they were the experts in Greek and Hebrew and experts in English language and they had a committee of a whole bunch of people who got together and decided on what it should say and yet one pastor comes up and says, well, it really means this. He's forsaking the evidence of the scripture and he's going with his feelings. That's why you've got all these translations. That's why you've got all these false doctrines. So even when people approach the Bible, when churches approach the Bible, they're doing so based on their feelings. I mean, he's not going to say, well, I feel that this is the correct translation. He's got to be more scholarly. Well, so-and-so commentator and so-and-so church says this is the translation, so we're going to go with that. you got to make it sound good. But why are you going with that and not with what the King James translators came up with? Because they're going by their feelings. They're not having faith in God. A lot of those translations, the newer translations, you look at them compared to the King James. You look at Galatians 2, all kinds of changes. That's because those modern translations don't believe the Word of God. If you believe the Word of God, you take the literal KJV. 
the modern translations say, oh, I'm walking by sight, not by faith, so I'm changing the words. So even in the more scholarly, the biblical type of reviews that pastors and churches and commentators do, they're still walking by sight and not by faith. And that's the primary difference between how God works and Satan works. Thanks for watching.